Hey all you nature nuts out there, it's Seth from Chronic Trips again and we're coming at you with another awesome outdoor report which focuses on current events and news in the outdoors. And so we're going to kind of leapfrog from last week. If you watched last week, we talked. About, we ended with a segment about a bird that popped up at my bird feeder. And if that made you happy and a bunch of other birds make you happy, well, we're going to cover um, how they can actually scientifically make you happy in this report. We're also going to talk about why woodpeckers don't stick to wood. And then we're, <laughs> and then we're also going to cover... Um, uh, a team that mapped a the genome of a platypus and so you might learn something you never knew about a platypus today so stick with us there's a this uh, a table of contents in the bottom so if you want to jump around you can the links to all the articles are in the description box as well and if you wouldn't mind giving us a like and a subscribe and all that jazz we would super love you for that so let's get to it if you're like me Birds make me happy. Uh, but this uh, study, like I said, actually kind of talks about it. So the title is Study Reveals Birds Are Linked to Happiness Levels. And this was done in Europe and specifically from a, a, a German group. And we'll get to that. So new research shows more bird species in their vicinity increases life satisfaction of Europeans as much as a higher income. Right? Right. So people that say money doesn't bring you happiness, well, it's actually uh, a bunch of different birds. <laughs> so the more diverse birds you have around you, the happier you seem to be. So more biological diversity evokes more happiness, says science. A new study has revealed that increased bird biodiversity brings in increased joy to people, according to recent findings from the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research. In fact, Scientists concluded that conservation is just as important for human well-being as financial security. Let that sink in for a minute while you look at this beautiful bird. High biodiversity in our vicinity is as important for life satisfaction as our income, says science. All across mm -hmm. Europe, the individual enjoyment of life correlates with the number of surrounding bird species. An additional 10% of bird species, therefore, increases the Europeans' life satisfaction as much as a comparable increase in income. Nature conservation thus constitutes an investment in human well-being. The study published in Ecological economics focused on European residents and determined that happiness correlated with a specific number of bird species. Researchers used the date from the 2012 European Quality of Life Survey to study the connection between the species' diversity in their surroundings and the life satisfaction in more than 26,000 adults from 26 European countries. Species diversity was measured based on a diversity of avian species as documented in the European European breeding bird atlas. <clears throat> so it kind of seems like a large uh, sample size but that's about you know based on the two numbers here it's a thousand people per country so I guess it's not too big but 26,000 is still pretty big. <clears throat> Europeans are particularly particularly satisfied with their lives if their immediate surroundings host a high species diversity, says lead author Joel Mathorst, a doctoral researcher at the Sackenberg Biodiversity and Climate Research Center, the IDIV, and the Goethe University in Frankfurt. According to our findings, the happiest Europeans are those who can experience numerous different bird species in their daily life, or who live near natural surroundings that are home to many species. So we all know that, uh, you know, there's a lot of studies out there that having just green uh, plant around you, having green space, like being able to go outside and see trees uh, has a, a ginormous impact on our quality of life. And now they're saying you can add birds to that and specifically, you know, a wide variety of birds. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it just woke up. What the hell's going on? <laughs> um, 14 additional birds in the area is equal to 150 extra dollars per month. 
The authors calculated that being around 14 additional bird species in the vicinity raised the level of life satisfaction at least as much as an extra 124 euros per month in the household account, based on an average income of 1,237 euros per month in Europe. <clears throat> That's incredible that they can correlate that with money, right? So it's something it helps us kind of quantify what they're talking about because it seems like a lot of humans can understand money pretty well. <laughs> oh, look at that one. <laughs> All right. So, more than 26,000 adults from 26 European countries were surveyed for the study. Researchers used data from 2012 European Quality Life Study to explore the connection between species diversity around homes, towns, and cities, and how it relates to satisfaction. Birds are well suited as indicators of biological diversity. According to the study authors, birds are some of the best indicators of biological diversity in any given area because they are usually seen or heard in their environments, especially in urban areas. However, more species were found near natural green spaces, forested areas, and bodies of water. That just kind of seems like a no-brainer. Like, you're going to always find birds more often than not in trees and in spaces that have trees than in just sky, a place that's filled with skyscrapers and that's it. <clears throat> so conservation as an investment for all. Nature conservation therefore not only ensures our material basis of life but it also constitutes an investment in the well-being of all, says Mathoris, lead author of the paper. So what this study shows is that you can link bird diversity to your happiness and equivalent it to an amount of money that uh, correlates to that amount of happiness that it brings you. Pretty freaking cool. If this doesn't make you want to get yourself a bird feeder um, or you know, find ways to attract more birds or become a birder, go out and look at birds. Um, I think that, or even, you know, get involved with your city and uh, talk to the conservation department and bring this stuff to them and be like, hey, what's going on? What's our plan with our conservation? What's our plan with the city, our town? And what's our plan on creating biodiversity amongst humans with animals and plants? Because like this says, it's an investment for in the well-being of us all by putting forth conservation efforts. Because if we're talking about, you know, topics like Medicare for all or just trying to create healthy uh, individuals, homeostasis, um, then you have to talk about the natural environment and how we can conserve it and bring it and bring it to the people, um, make it accessible for people all that jazz, um, because it's important. You all got to stay happy, especially in times like these. Have you ever wondered why a woodpecker never gets stuck to a tree when it pecks the wood? And did you know that when the woodpecker hits the tree, its tongue actually wraps around its brain to insulate it from the impact of shoving its face into wood a thousand times a second? <laughs> um, so that's pretty amazing, but, you know, let's go over this a little bit. So the video reveals why woodpeckers don't get stuck to trees. And they explain it pretty simply right here. A hammer, hammer a nail into a tree and it will get stuck. So why doesn't the same thing happen to the sharp beak of woodpeckers? Scientists say they finally have the answer. In a new study, researchers took high-speed videos of two black woodpeckers pecking away at hardwood trunks in zoos and analyze them frame by frame to see how the head and beak move throughout each peck. The bird's secret, an ability to move its upper and lower beaks independently. The team reports this week at the virtual annual meeting of the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology. Once the tip of the woodpecker's bill hits the wood, the bird's head rotates to the side ever so slightly lifting the top part of the beak and twisting it a bit in the other direction. The videos reveal this pull 
this, uh, this pole opens the bill a tiny amount and creates free space between the beak tip and the wood at the bottom of the punctured hole so the bird can easily retract its beak. Until now, scientists have thought woodpecker bills would need to be rigidly attached to the skull to successfully drill into the wood to find insect prey. But actually, the bill's flexibility in these joints ensures that the, bill, the bird's signature rat-a-tat doesn't stop at rat. That's pretty fascinating. So let's look at the video here. So they do it kind of like, they'll do it in slow motion in a second. But just like they were saying, you can see that it slightly turns and its beak does open. See, open a little bit so it doesn't get stuck. Look at it again. Like this one, you can actually see like the tip is actually separated, right? So it's kind of like jabbing differently. This one, it's all closed until it hits and then it opens that ever so slightly. See that? So their beaks aren't actually rigidly attached to the skull. Their joints flex and both the top and bottom flex independently from each other. So, um, so that is the main difference between a nail and a woodpecker's beak, if you're ever wondering. If you're a nature nut like me, you're kind of fascinated by all things that are in the outdoors, whether it's like look a seemingly simple plant or the most oddest little creature on earth, like a, a platypus. Um, it all fascinates me. Some of it's easier to explain than others, but um, it's, it's all super fascinating and there's nothing like a platypus. Uh, <laughs> and they, there's new science coming out on them, and it's pretty cool. And there's some things in this article that I never knew about them, and uh, maybe you'll learn something new as well. But they're actually starting to uh, map the genome of a platypus and kind of see more what's up with this thing. And so uh, let's, let's uh, get into it. So the summary is Australia's beaver-like duck-billed platypus exhibits an array of bizarre characteristics. It lays eggs instead of giving birth to live babies, sweats milk, has venomous spurs, and is even equipped with 10 sex chromosomes. Now researchers have conducted a unique mapping of the platypus genome and found answers regarding to the origins of a few of its stranger features. So, let's see what they tell us. Often considered the world's oddest mammal, Australia's beaver-like duck-billed platypus exhibits an array of bizarre char characteristics, like we just said. It lays eggs instead of giving birth to live babies, sweats milk, has venomous spurs, and even equipped with 10 sex chromosomes. Now an international team of researchers, da, 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 led by University of Copenhagen, has conducted a unique mapping of the platypus genome and found answers regarding to origins of a few of its stranger features. Gotta love Europe right now. They're just like going in on the environmental science. Love it. Um, it lays eggs, but nurses. It is toothless, has a venomous spur, has webbed feet, fur that glows under UV light, and has 10 sex chromosomes. Ever since Europeans discovered the, the platypus in Australia during the late 1700s, the quirky, duck-billed, semi-aquatic creature has baffled scientific researchers. Modern-day researchers are still trying to understand how the platypus, often considered to be the world's oddest mammal, got to be so unique. Their understandings have now advanced to a great degree. For the first time, an international team of researchers led by the University of Copenhagen biologists has mapped a complete platypus genome. The complete thing they've done. The study is published in the scientific journal Nature. The complete genome has provided us with the answers to how a few of the platypus's bizarre, or <laughs> bizarre, bizarre features emerged. At the same time, decoding the genome for platypus is important for improving our understanding of how other mammals evolved, including us humans. It holds the key as to why we and other eutheria mammals evolved to become animals that give birth to live young instead of egg-laying animals. 
Imagine if humans would a legs, <laughs> or a, a legs, <laughs> lay eggs. Explains Professor Gu Shi Zhang of Department of Biology. Sorry, I messed your name up. The platypus belongs to an ancient group of mammals, meno, monotremes, which existed millions of years prior to emergence of any modern-day mammal. Indeed, the platypus belongs to the mammalia class, but genetically it is a mixture of mammals, birds, and reptiles. What a unique creature. It has preserved many of its ancestors' original features, which probably contribute to its success in adapting to the environment they live in. Lays eggs, sweats milk, and has no teeth. One of the platypus' most unusual characteristics characteristics is that while it lays eggs, it also has mammary glands used to feed its babies. Not through nipples, but by milk, which is sweat from its body. Right? Imagine if, you know, you ladies out there are like, oh man, I need to give my kids some milk. And you just started sweating, and that's how you did it. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Seems like a lot uh, cheaper than buying those breast pumps and everything. During our own evolution, we humans lost all three so-called vitellogenin genes, each of which is important for the production of egg yolks. For the production of egg yolks. Chickens, on the other hand, continue to have all three. The study demonstrates that platypuses still carry one of these three vitellogenin genes. I don't know if I'm spell, uh, saying that correctly. Despite having lost the other two roughly 130 million years ago, you know, just yesterday. The platypus continues to lay eggs by virtue of this one remaining gene. This is probably because it is not as dependent on creating yolk proteins as birds and reptiles are, as platypuses produce milk for their young. Huh. In all other mammals, vitelligen in genes have been replaced with casein genes, which are responsible for our ability to produce casein gene, a protein a major component of ma in mammalian milk. The new research demonstrates that the platypus carries casein genes as well, and that the composition of their milk is thereby quite similar to that of cows, humans, and other mammals. So, you know, why aren't we milking platypuses? All they gotta do is sweat. Seems like a lot less invasive. No, I'm just kidding. We should not be doing that. Um, and it informs us that milk production in all ex extant mammal species has been developed through the same set of genes derived from a common ancestor which lived more than 170 million years ago, alongside the early dinosaurs in the Jurassic period. Another trait that makes the platypus so unique is that, unlike the vast majority of mammals, it is toothless, although this monotreme's nearest ancestors were toothed. The modern platypus is equipped with two horn plates that are used to mash food. The study reveals that the platypus lost its teeth roughly 120 million years ago, when four of the eight genes responsible for tooth development disappeared. Only animal with 10 sex chromosomes. Yet another platypus oddity investigated by researchers was how their sex is determined. Both humans and every other mammal on Earth have two sex chromosomes that determine sex, the X and the Y chromosome system, in which XX is female and XY is male. The monotremes, however, including our duck-billed friends from down under, have ten sex chromosomes with five Y and five X. Thanks to the near-complete chromosomal level genomes, researchers can now suggest that these 10 sex chromosomes in the ancestors of the monotremes were organized in a ring form, which was later broken away into many small pieces of X and Y chromosomes. At the same time, the genome mapping reveals that the majority of monotreme sex chromosomes have more in common with chickens than with humans. But what it shows is an evolutionary link between mammals and birds. So we can kind of use, um, we can kind of use a, a platypus to help see that bridge. Um, platypus facts: the platypus is endemic to eastern Australia and Tasmania. It is a protected species and classified by the IUCN as near threatened. Among the reasons why platypuses are considered mammals, they have mammary glands, grow hair, 
and have three bones in their middle ears. Each trait helps to define a mammal. And so if you remember what those three bones are, do you know what they are? They are uh -huh. hammer, anvil, stirrup, right? It's one of the easiest ones to remember. Um, the platypus belongs to the mammalian order monotreme, so named because monotremes use a singular opening for urination, defecation, and sexual reproduction. That's uh, interesting. <laughs> the animal is an excellent swimmer and spends much of its time hunting for insects and shellfish in rivers. Its distinctive beak is filled with electrical sensors which are used to locate prey in muddy riverbeds, so they don't always have to see. The male platypus has a venomous spur behind each of its hind legs. The venom is poison enough to kill a dog and is deployed when males fight for territory. Ah. Another 2020 study demonstrated that platypus's fur is fluorescent. The animal's brown fur reflects a blue-green color when placed under UV light. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you learned something about our feathered friends, uh, our pecking friends, Mr. Woodpecker, and uh, platypus. And so next week, next Sunday, we'll come back at you with another outdoor report focusing on current events and news. If you have anything that interests you, just leave it in the comments below, and maybe we'll highlight it on the next report. Um, other than that, we'll come at you with some awesome stuff. And... Uh, Thank you for being here, like and subscribe, all that jazz, and see you next week.